Well, hey, hi again, everybody. Dan John here for DanJohnUniversity.com and DanJohn.net. Hey, I've had a lot of requests for guests on our show, and so I made a, a good decision. I, <laughs> I invited one of the most important names in our business that you don't know yet, but you will. Um, this is my good friend, Taylor Lewis, and Taylor and I are going to have some conversations. Uh, we're going to talk about easy strength today, but not just easy strength like, you know, you lift weights five days a week, but how easy strength, and this is going to sound like over the top, hyperbole, but how easy strength can change lives. So first, Taylor, give us who you are. Yeah, so I'm a strength coach. Um, I met Dan in 2012, sitting at a bar in Boston. The whole thing he talks about is showing up. I showed up for a, a conference that he was the keynote speaker. Didn't even know who he was at the time. I just heard about him. I wanted to actually go see Mike Boyle. And this guy just taps me on the shoulder and says, anyone sitting here? And then, what, 10 years later, nine years later? Here we are. Here we are. Um, I'm a, I was a strength coach for uh, baseball players at a Division II college at Sonoma State for about five years and then went on my own and started working with uh, – Patients with cystic fibrosis, along with major league athletes, baseball players in particular, and um, yeah, started doing research in CF, and this is where we're at with Easy Strength. Yeah, so there's going to be two things I want you to always remember, and this is this is really a big part of my career. So he's not going to tell you who he works with, but trust me, the the baseball players he's worked with, even if you're even if you're a, a non-American, you don't follow baseball, I guarantee you know. You probably know the, the names he's worked with. They're that famous. They're beyond sports famous. If something works for the elite athlete in performance, but it also works for a population with issues, uh, and that could be any kind of issues, then I take that and I look at that and I, and, I, and I make this idea, and I think we're good with this. If it works for people with cystic fibrosis and it works with elite performance athletes, we can just stand back and say, this works. Yes. This and that, That's not the most scientific thing. Uh, I was just telling him here a minute ago, my podcast is pretty much like chimpanzees at the <laughs> zoo throwing poop at people. <laughs> like that's probably the best. That probably should be the name of the podcast. It should. It should. But we won't because well, we're too professional. <laughs> now, there's a couple things about Taylor he didn't mention. First off, that this weekend he discovered... Uh, Drinking bourbon late into the night. Yes. And he also discovered waking up early in the morning the next day with with no effects, right? Yep. And when someone says, do you want to go to a Boston College, Boston University hockey game, what's the correct thing to say? Yes. Do you want to go watch the Super Bowl at Mike Boyle's house? Yes. And in another thing, he, he was, this is something that's very hard to get. In fact, I think it's the highest honor in strength and conditioning. Oh, that's right, yeah. You forgot. Would you tell people yeah. who you are? I am one of four. Very few. Four? Or it might be five now. Five. Dan John Black Belts. Probably one of the best, you know, credentials I can have behind my name. And I have a few credentials behind my name. But um, the whole concept with the Dan John Black Belt is, A, you have to show up. You have to help an underserved community, and you have to make a difference in people's lives and stuff like that. And oh, hold on, I don't want to, I don't want to give away the whole thing. Okay, but those are the two big. Show up. Yep. Help those who need help. Yep. Make a difference. Well, do you want to tell them the the, the penultimate moment? Then you're gonna go and hang out in Disney World, and you have to drink around the world. And there is some, you know, there's a criteria to finish, but I know we won't go into that because that's part of the the you kind go of to mystery Epcot of it. And you go to the you go to the pavilions, the, and yep. you have to drink around the world with me. Yeah, there's other stuff involved. <clears throat> I'll just say this uh, historically: the picture of Taylor successfully uh, achieving his black belt. He has his space. <laughs> He has his baseball cap barely on. Let's just say this, and it's, and it's tilted this way, and he looks like he's just drank around the world. So let's... Well, it's cute because it was a Valentine's Day, too. Was it Valentine's Yeah, we did it on Valentine's Day. Oh, so I thought that was kind of sweet. You know, Dan was like, yeah, so you can be my Valentine. It's a true, <laughs> true story. All right, <clears throat> let's jump to the chase. Um, what was nice about meeting uh, Taylor is when we first met, uh, Easy Strength was kind of just getting... 
I had been using it, obviously, for, I don't want to say a decade by then, but the, the toolkit, by the way, Easy Strength, is there's nothing new about it. It is the way strong men trained in 1910. The, the concept has been around a long time. You can find the ideas in track and field in the 1960s. One of the reasons it disappeared is because of PEDs, performance enhancing drugs. Um, you don't need, I mean, I hate to be so blunt, but if, if you have enough drugs, you don't need to be very smart as a coach. Yeah. I mean, I know that's, yeah. Yeah. But if you don't have drugs, you really have to think. You have to think, trust, and, 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 and the process becomes crucial. They're just uh, strategic in a way. Much more strategic. Yeah. So w what I want you to do is first talk about cyst what cystic fibrosis is, short, short version. And number two, how you got involved with training uh, people with this condition. And then, if you don't mind, would you talk about the research you did? And then we'll, uh, we'll come to a part. We'll, we'll discuss more. Go. So, yeah. So, cystic fibrosis is a, um, an autosomal recessive genetic disease that you get. Each per person has what we call this CFTR, cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductant regulator gene in our body. And what happens is um, this gene gets mutated and when it builds um, a protein, the CFTR protein, which is an ion channel within um, tissue, it gets mutated, it changes and the severity changes. So CF is rare um, and you get a copy if one parent has it. We, so I could have it and my partner could have it and we could pass it on to our kid who could have CF. And what that does is, um, depending, it's a multi-system disease where it affects multiple organs. Everyone's different, so it's case by case. Some people have some lung complications, pancreatic complications, and then there's liver and diabe uh, diabetic issues and stuff, depending on who you talk about. And then we're starting to see now it's affecting skeletal tissue and, so, and the nerves and everything around it. And that's, I mean, CF in a nutshell right there. And the most common... From my weak understanding, one of the most common things is the, the lung and the coughing, right? The yeah. So what happens is mucus gets built up in the lungs and it will um, it will attract bacteria. And usually we cough up mucus, we cough up the bacteria, get it out of our system. Where that usually stays with CF. And then there's some in inflammatory responses, scarring of the lungs start to happen. And that's where decreases lung function um, start to occur and stuff like that. And you've told me that some people literally cough for up like two hours a day right yeah yeah there's and cf is like a every day that you're doing something to treat your you know your disease in a sense you know you're some people have to take i've had clients i've had to take 40 you know um pills a day they're doing two to three respiratory treatments a day it's a very time consuming daily you know thing they have to do just to survive to take another breath this is what's so impactful and trying to find a system for training we all already you know sometimes have cr uh, crunched at times to do workouts and cf just add another three hours of work to your daily activities and you, you're not necessarily going to want to uh, work out as hard and stuff like that so and one of the issues <clears throat> i mean if i'm standing here uh, as an outsider i would say well then we need cardiovascular training boy we need to get these lungs and stuff in shape. But Taylor went in a different direction. Would you share what you tried? Yeah, so eight, let's see, eight years in a, eight years ago, I was approached about uh, writing some programs for CF. This was when I was doing uh, my master's thesis. And at the time I was looking at doing something on post-activation potentiation. And there's a lot of work out there. But then I was like, you know what? I don't really know what CF, CF is. I looked into it and I saw a lot of studies were being done or had been done on aerobic training, aerobic capacity, and limited on strength training. And so we, I was, my theory was, well, if you get the muscles stronger, the joints move easier, it's less on the lungs to move. So it's like, well, if they're, they're not as strong as they could be, then they're going to have to use their cardiopulmonary system at a higher level. So I took a client that, um, and we took their their cardio out for the most part. They just walked their dogs, did this for three months, and we incorporated Easy Strength. And we did it at a format of three days a week, no more than 10 repetitions, every lift. And in three months, they improved their six-minute walk distance, which is a, they do, there's a six-minute walk test 
that um, helps to correlate with mortality, but also um, functional capacity. So they improve their distance, but an, one very impactful thing is they actually improve their lung function. And so it was this like, the people were wondering, it's like, well, why did they, you know, if there was no aerobic component to it, how does their lung function improve? And my theory from everything was, it's like, well, they're stronger, so it's easier to move. You're able, mechanical forces when you hit the ground, there's less absorption there that's going to be able to distribute it in a, in a poor way, which means the lungs and heart don't have to work as hard to get oxygen to the muscles. And that's the theory I also had with why they improve their distance in the, in the six minute walk test. So kind of cut to the chase, you improve people's cardio, people with this condition by lifting weights. Yep. So we know this the same in track and field, gentle listener. We know that I can make you a better long distance runner by getting you stronger in the weight room. And in my world, I don't care why. My, and, I mean, right. if you run faster, jump higher, throw farther, I don't care. You, <laughs> if you come up with a new technique and it goes farther, you're right. Uh, if you, you say I'm doing... I'm lifting weights every morning and I'm running faster. You are right. But what's cool is that, uh, or important, and this is, this is why I have them on, is that, again, so if we elite athletes are getting better by doing easy strength or just lifting weights, and it's helping people with this very, very difficult condition. Folks, I, I, I don't want to go too deep. I don't want to go, but I have a, a good friend who has the disease, and, and you know the person. Mm -hmm. And to... To watch the improvement in her quality of life because of certain things, it is it it, it makes you want to jump out of bed in the morning and make and make a difference and, and make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> very simply, I guess this is why we're talking is that three days a week. How many weeks? Now, by one, there, there's an asterisk, right? Because you did three days a week, whatever a week ended up being, right? Yeah. So, well, with this, I was actually they were actually able to go for three months. I've had clients where it's like okay we have we four weeks on we'll do try to get to three months but that may turn into four months because once again there's things that can come up you know and so so yeah. many of his clients his the people he works with will end up in the hospital for a couple of days right uh, yeah they can have exacerbations that ends up in the hospital there's also clinic visits there's you know there's there's stuff that's required you know to maintain good health to a certain degree yeah so I, I don't want to be a, a jerk, but the next time you tell me that, oh, what do I do because I'm, I'm going to miss a workout because it's my child's birthday party, let's change that to a very intensive hospital visit yeah. where literally the, the scales of life and death occasionally are right there, right? Yeah. I, I, I mean, from some of the clients that I've talked to, it's, it's in their heads every day to a certain degree. And the magnitude changes, you know, and everyone's different too. So every case is case by case and it affects people differently. But yeah, it's, it's a daily yeah. thought. So <clears throat> I'm getting people, you know, I'm getting, you know, people, uh, I'm trying to do easy strength five days a week, but you know, on Thursdays, it's, you know, my badminton class. Well, okay. It'll still work. I just want you to know that, uh, <laughs> Sometimes I think in the great scope of things, we have to remind ourselves, and I, and I mean this, and I, that, you know, um, some somebody else always has it a little bit harder. Uh, if somebody else's burdens are usually bigger. It's, there's an old thing in uh, theology classes we used to talk about. Everybody has their own cross, and there's this idea that there's this big room or warehouse where you go into, and there's all these different crosses, and you keep trying to bear other people's burdens. Yeah. And at the end, you always pick your own. Yeah. <laughs> You always pick your own cross. Uh, well, um, so this is part one. Uh, Taylor and I are going to go into some other things uh, later. But I guess if there's a, a summary from part one is that something as simple as lifting weights can make a difference with, with people who have conditions. Yes. And yeah, absolutely. And what's weird is that strength training, I hate to say you proved help cardio. But strength training help people on cardio tests. Yep. So, it, it, sorry, when it comes to the scientific method, you got to always be kind of careful about overstating. So, what we are saying here is this. My young man friend here proved that strength training helped with aerobic tests. 
and quality of life. Because because another thing too you got to think about is sometimes maturation and there's it tends to be digestive issues and stuff. So taking in food and stuff like that. And I have some clients you know that eat more because of the the increased strength training. And once again, it's you know two sets of five or five five three two or something like that. And it's still thresholds for them are you know we're pushing 50 to 70 percent one rep max so it's not like they're sitting in the weight room for two hours you could know? you give me <clears throat> the most basic uh just give me day one of the most basic program go ahead just a two by five where we're just we'll see well i focus on whatever their 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 weakest link is first so if it's a squat or a deadlift we'll go there first and then we'll go to an upper body and then back to a lower body and then upper body two sets of five for two weeks and then we start to go and change the rep rep schemes, and then just vary the weights. I the the tip that I really like from Dan stuff is don't miss a rep, and that's help them understand like how much weight should I use? It's like well I don't want you to miss a rep, and I want you to be able to walk out like you you could do more. And that's saying a lot for someone that has barriers that have some you know lung complications and stuff like that. So you you have to manage that, and that's one thing about easy strength is recovery. And maybe we talk about in part two, but what's good about easy strength with CF is multiple days of recovery from hard lifts could be double that for someone with CF or something like that. Good point. So like the recovery that's, you don't need as much recovery in a, to a certain degree when for easy strengths, which is actually allowed them to do three to four days sometimes versus just doing two days and then having a week off because it's just exacerbating symptoms, other things. It could not necessarily be muscle soreness, but that could directly affect other organs you know and which it does so if you stress your body too much in one system you're using the other systems and so if they're at a slight decline that's going to put more stress on them but this allows them that kind of sweet spot where to kind of get everything moving well together well there you go <laughs> so listen uh pavel and i are uh, are rewriting the book easy strength and Taylor's influence is going to be a big part of the book. So when we come back, we'll have more. We'll talk about recovery, and we'll talk about maybe a few stories. Uh, and then, of course, we'll then have to go in and uh, edit those stories out. So yes. Thank you so far, Taylor. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. So we've been talking about easy strength and how easy strength works, obviously, in my world of performance sports and Taylor's world of performance sports with baseball. And that's great, but... More importantly, Taylor's work has gotten us to understand the impact it has with people of certain kinds of medical conditions. And one of my goals, I guess, uh, long term, and I don't know if I'll be on this earth when it's completed, but I'd like to see the concepts of easy strength and getting stronger to be a, just a normal part of medical intervention with issues. My friend Taylor here is, uh, is I would say, probably the leading strength coach in the field of cystic fibrosis would you agree i would say i'm up there yeah yeah well, yeah <laughs> the many of us there <laughs> yes the, the, the multitudes the <laughs> so uh what we wanted to talk about we talked about how earlier about how strength can help cardio for a number of reasons mm -hmm. um if you're stronger your gait is going to be better and you're gonna do better on a six minute walk if you're stronger your stride will be longer you'll improve your six minute walk. Okay. But you mentioned recovery and I want to talk about that now. So go ahead, please. Well, kind of adding to that too, is like with uh, lung transplant patients, they mm -hmm. talk about the stronger you are going into a lung transplant, the better outcomes there can be post lung transplant. So going tying into recovery, that's what's good about easy strength is that you're able to build strength and you're able to repeat that on a, you know, weekly basis but keep that threshold in a realm that you don't have to recover for a week or two from a lift. You meant you mentioned the never miss thing as being really helpful for right. the, the people with CF. Yeah, because the whole the kind of there's a battle every day, right? There's a battle to survive, take a next, another breath. So the stronger you can get yourself, the better. So when you don't have to miss a rep, you don't have to miss a workout that allows you to kind of progress because if you take a step back since cf is a multi-system disease that step back is not maybe just one step it could be five steps back and then all of a sudden it starts to play the mental game too it's like i worked hard to get here and now i take a couple steps back and all everyone at some point is going to go through that process wow 
You know, we were just talking earlier about where we wanted to head. And one of my favorite questions, and I get this question a lot, and honestly, I'm not very good at it, but I wanted to ask Taylor this question. Um, and I think it helps. I think it helps it make a good conversation. And the question is as simple as can be. Uh, what do you wish you knew when you first started being a strength coach? I think what I wish I would have done oh, okay. would have spent more time reading and listening. Not necessarily listening to my professors, but using them, the t maximizing the tool that my pro professors gave me. Because I played baseball in college. My whole focus was baseball. I want to, you know, I want to get a major league contract. Then I had these bright professors teaching me exercise physiology, different things. And I wish I would have spent a little bit more time picking their brains on what they were doing themselves, the research they were looking into. Because now I'm back doing a PhD and I remember some of the stuff that they have taught me. It's like, man, if I would have had more time to pick their brain on certain questions at the time, I think it could definitely maximize. And when you're in college, you have this opportunity to walk, you know, from the dorms to the office of the professor without going anywhere. And you have this library that you can read tons of information from and get this degree. It's all right there. It's yeah. all right there. And you, the, their barriers to a certain degree are starting to be limited because you can just find out with, and so I wish I would have spent a little bit more time picking the brains and, you know, sitting down and talking to my professors about different things with, you know, exercise physiology and the different exercise science um, components. Where, where was your, as you look back, you've done some smart stuff, and I, and I, but do you, did you make a bad turn at all? Uh, like, for example, I'd say, for me, it was listening to the bodybuilders, the, the people from Nautilus, the people from the workout that shall not be named. Those were my biggest errors. Having said that, I learned a lot from it because a two-year mistake, you better get some lessons. What was your biggest detours, bad bad choices, mistakes? It, I think it's just getting too hyper-focused on one philosophy and methodology. Because you oh. get excited about what some outcomes are coming, and you, <laughs> you start to get like, oh, there must be more, and it must just keep on increasing, but there's it doesn't just keep going up and up. And especially when you start working with different populations and stuff like that, you have to kind of learn the foundation of what it's all about and then from there add to it in ways but not be like this is the only approach possible. And what I do like about one thing I did was when I was done with baseball, I decided, and that's how I met you, was I need to go learn from as many coaches as possible. And it's not just online. It's go there, sit down with them, be a fly on the wall just see how they coach, what their system is, but also their environment that they've created because that's often missed sometimes when you buy you know, a lecture online or a system online that you're going to learn from. You, you only get to learn what the science component, but not how they necessarily apply it. Well, and it reminds me of the night we spent at Mike Boyle's house watching the Super Bowl. Yeah. You know, we were at, the, at Mike's house, and, and Mike is, I mean, a, a fabulous strength coach or one of the most insightful people. I've never met someone who constantly, he, he's the master, I think, of taking a tool and adapting it to his specific location. Yeah. This is, okay, here's a good idea. Okay. Here's how we can make this idea work here. But, you know, you were on the floor of Mike Boyle's house. You've been on, you've been passed out in this house many times. You've, uh, uh, you yes. were writing. You were writing on napkins, the quadrants in front of his fireplace. Yeah. Before you came out with the book. Right. And then we're at the bar the day before talking about it. And he says, "Oh, I'm working on this." And at the time, I had no idea what he was talking about because, you know, I just met Dan John. Yeah. Like I hadn't been reading his stuff really. Yeah. And so, but once you've been to Mike Boyle's house, and you met his wife and kids, and you. Then when you read something like Mike talking about having a balance, Mike's very good about talking about balance, but you were in his house, you were sitting in his chair, you ate his food, and you have much greater clarity. I think the same about seeing Brett Contreras. You know, I went out and I visited Brett at two of his different places. And so when I, I understand Brett's passion about certain things much better because I've seen his equipment yeah. and I've seen the rigor he's put into his point of view. Now, you can disagree with Mike, you can disagree with me, you can disagree with Taylor, 
you can disagree with Brett, but once you've been on the ground and you see, you better have a you better have a convincing argument to out to tell any well to tell especially those two you're wrong. You know when you when when you're with Stu McGill, all of a sudden you get a sense is, at best I have a smelly opinion on back stuff, because after you've been with Stu, it's hard to be even think that you know anything about backs. I mean, well, I know where they are. They're, they're back there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the environment, like you said, is like very important, even if it's not to learn. It's like if I wanted, if you want to train a certain athlete, you need to go live in their world for a little bit because yeah. you're not going to be able – you may have the right tools, but how are you going to communicate? So when I started with CF, I had no idea. So I was like, okay, what's the best thing I did? I contacted a doctor at Stanford University at the CF clinic and says, do you care if I just do any observations? I just want to – understand the system from the medical side from the personal yeah. side and it it allowed me to integrate easy strength in a way that works for people with cf because i couldn't just be like okay i'm going to take easy strength and we're going to do exactly how it is because it wouldn't work that way because it's just there's just too many elements that you can't plan for and so i think getting there and being around the environment is a very powerful thing you can be the smartest person in the world but if you've never been in that element then how are you going to relay that in a way that's going to keep people consistent but see those linear positive gains? Gentle listener, that's the million dollar thing for the day. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's it, it's the cliche, you got to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes and all that stuff. But it's absolutely true. Uh, when I, we had, used to have people visit my, my, my old facility when I was coaching in a high school. And they would say, I, I'm going to take and do everything at my place. And I go, you can't. Yeah, because they were an after-school program, and I was a class. My class was an hour and a half, and a bell would ring, and there. Well, actually, okay, class, you got to go shower, go. Well, after school is different. You don't right. you, you don't take attendance because it's voluntary. It's there was so many things that wouldn't work in an after-school setting. It's still great. You can right. still do it, and it's weird because. You got to be careful just taking five sets of two and saying, okay, five sets of two, five exercises, throw it in the thing. It's not working because you didn't, you didn't walk a mile. You didn't, you, your clients, your athletes, your whoever have different things going on. And you constantly have to, I, I think co great coaching is about fundamentals. Embrace the obvious, that stuff. True. And then it's adapting to the specific place and purpose. Yeah, it's like they talk about get a certification, but it's not just get a certification. You need to be there and, and encompass it. And it's I think the context is lost sometimes when people learn like in the exercise in exercise science world. And these are barriers at the same time when I was in college. I'm like, all right, 8 to 12 for hypertrophy, this and that. And then you do X, Y, Z in the books. And I was like, it makes sense, but at the same time, like it doesn't. Like it, it seems yeah. too easy to just say, give someone eight repetitions and this outcome is going to occur. And then, sure enough, when I left school and I went and, you know, went to Boyles, met you, and then Cressy, and then all these other coaches, Stu McGill, it's just like, okay, there's a lot more here that needs to be learned. And one thing I learned when I did um, Stu's course, it was like when he has his assessments, he has everything set up to a T. From the time they get there, it's like I interview at a certain degrees, like based on what the research says. And it's like, this is why this guy's the best. It's not just I know back, but how he presents the information, how he sets up the, the assessment and evaluation. It's all calculated. And that's like, why is Dr. Stu McGill one of the best ever? There's everything is set up in a system and because he's... He's looked and researched it to find out what's my best way to get the information I'm trying to do to help that individual. The details. The, the, the details. The weird details. Yeah. And it's not just the coaching because I'm sure that you can teach someone to coach someone to do a certain thing, but getting the right information needed to be able to establish a progressive approach is sometimes lost. And mm -hmm. that, you know, and that's really key. You know, you're funny. You said that about hypertrophy, you know, there's, and I agree. I still think Tom DeLorme and Watkins are right. You know, progressive resistance exercise, that 15 to 30 reps, generally you're three sets of eight. Let's just say yeah. the magic hypertrophy program, three sets of 10, 12, whatever it is. 
And yet the best progress I ever made on my body, I never did more in triples. Yeah. Well, how, how is that? That's, that's, you can't be growing. I put on 40 pounds in four months under Dick Notmeyer's guidance doing snatches and cleaning jerks. And that was it. Uh, singles, doubles, triples. And I just got massive. Well, that doesn't fit the research. Yeah, but you know what? When you're throwing weight over your head for an hour and a half, two hours, and then switching exercises and then doing that again, you know, there's gonna be a little, there's gonna be some muscle building going on. Well, and to to add to that too is I have clients when we talk about oh, like multi joint exercises are the best for hypertrophy and this and that. I was like, okay, well, what if I have a client that has 35% lung function and I give them 12 repetitions? If their muscles are not going to fatigue before their lungs and heart have elevated to a point where they need to stop. So isolation, leg extension, leg curls, it goes to like it depends. I need them to build muscle and unfortunately sometimes the lungs don't have the capacity to do it or the heart or a certain organ is just not working at optimal levels. So maybe five reps is better at a weight because their lungs don't go out. They still get a good workout in. And you're still building. And you're doing leg extensions, not, you know, clean and jerks. Right. Because that's, so. Well, and the multi-joint exercises are great and we do them, but we, it's not, it's like, it's not the end all be all. And sometimes they come in, it's just like, uh, it's just, you can just tell right off the bat because we'll do some, you know, metrics before oxygen saturation, yeah. do some stuff to see. And it's just like the hand grip when people do it before. And if they measure low, they're not going to work out hard. Same thing is sometimes you just. You just need them in there. You just, let's do something. If it's leg extensions, great. If it's deadlifts, but it's like multi-joint is not necessarily always going to be the prize choice in, in certain cases. I tell my listeners all the time that the most important thing you can give me is feedback. And, and I always talk about this feedback loop with coaching and it is constantly changing. And that's why I think being an American football coach was so good for me as a strength coach, because this is a hard thing to explain to people, but when you have 11 athletes and they're 11 athletes and you have the seven officials and you have the sidelines and you have the fans in the stands and you have, I mean, grass and snow, water, mud, and then constantly the, the game just constantly changes. And I got 25 seconds, to get a play in and boom, 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 boom. What that taught me was that I, as a coach, we live in a, this, feedback loop yeah and if i ever come to you with a program that's built of marble it's i'm too stupid to be a coach anymore because it's got to be malleable it's got things change and with your clients literally things can change day to day week to week you know when i i work with major league baseball teams but i'm not gonna tell you who because <laughs> I can't remember their names. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things interesting, their easy strength program, they'll tell me very often, I'll say, so you do, you train, you know, you know, three to five times a week. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And they'll go, yeah, absolutely. And then they'll stop and go, except sometimes a week will take about three weeks. Yeah. Wait, oh, you know, I'm, I'm no math whiz, but, I, you know, three weeks is three weeks and one week is one week. But if you're on the road, like we talked earlier today, uh, you know, your plane flight sun you got travels you got bad hotels you got bad food you got all kinds of things and you got someone who's just sore from playing or had a hard collision or a slide so that monday wednesday friday becomes monday saturday next saturday next tuesday there's your week right and sometimes like well like oh we like to be sore but the player doesn't necessarily like to be sore like just because we like things doesn't mean they like things. So we're going into their world. And even then, like thinking of that, some athletes have multiple coaches. You know, you have a baseball coach. You could have, yeah. you know, a hitting coach. You could have. And then I worked with an athlete that had a, an, a running coach. And I would get him after he's already done an hour of cardio right after. So it's like, yes, I would love to change how that was programmed. But they, they says this is when you're going to get this is when you're going to work with him and that's what you're going to get and that's it and so I had to work around that where yeah we'd probably get you know increased gains if he wasn't running right before we went into heavy lifting so we had to modify and it it worked you know well it's it's what I talk about when when I'm talking about coaching swimmers and track and field athletes lift throw lift jump you know lift 
swim. Okay, there's your, there's your two things. But when you're working with an American football team, baseball team, like you just said, there's hitting, there's base stealing, there's technique, there's technique, there's strategies, there's tactics, there's there's, 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 there's. And we have to constantly step back and remind ourselves that. And that's kind of where we're, that's kind of why I think the, the idea behind easy strength is get in there and get as strong as you possibly can. As easy as you can do it in the least amount of time. Right. Well, and the hand hand goes up. Well, what about this quality? Well, does a swimmer need hypertrophy? Does a swimmer need to look really good? Well, no. I mean, obviously, there's a swimmer type, right. but you, no one. I know that the sprinters like to do a little bodybuilding competition after, but they're they're a different cat anyway. But for most of us, in in certain, in most of us, it's lift. Well, many of our listeners lift life, lift life. Yeah. And you don't need to beat yourself to death to do that. Yeah. And you have to understand it's very relative. Like you can't, you can't take a program from a football player and take the concepts that they're saying you can, in general, you take it and then you modify yeah, it yeah. and you, but you don't, it's not going to be the same specific. It's very relative to the individual, their sport, their environment too, because once you get to know these people, there's a lot, a lot of things going on, and if you want to be with them for a while, then you you also have to, as a coach, be willing to give up a little bit in a sense, knowing that it'd be pro- probably better with me working on these fundamentals and for mastery than just you know if you think someone else in a sense if you didn't want to give up a time slot or if I said no, the only way I'm going to work with him is if he does running after it. They're like, all right, thank you, we'll find someone else. Like you were highly recommended, but this is what's happening. This is what's worked for him, and we want you to be a part of the team. But you know, and once again, there's a line at which you will go. But we, I was able to do it. You know, using easy strength and stuff like that, it helped him win a World Series and get a five-year contract. So yeah, yeah. I mean, well, um, do you have anything more to add? You think? No, this is going good. Yeah, thanks for having me. My friend Taylor Lewis. Hey, t- tell, uh, tell the fine people where we get more information about you. Yeah, so you can follow um, us on Instagram at pulmonary-performance.com or my personal Instagram, Taylor E. Lewis. Facebook, Pulmonary Performance Institute. And then, um, let's see, YouTube, same thing, Pulmonary Performance Institute. So find us. That's good stuff. I, I When Taylor speaks, I listen. And... Uh... I hope you don't mind this little special edition of our podcast. Uh, I'll be back smarter and brighter than ever uh, <laughs> next time we get together. And uh, again, thank you, Taylor. Uh, wonderful. Uh, I hope to do this kind of thing more often. And do yourself a favor. Start following this guy. Pay attention to what he says. Uh, and, and if you can remember this, if a training program works with the elite athletes in performance and a training program works with someone who's who's got a condition like cystic fibrosis you can kind of step back and say it works and you can run with it okay i hope that helps uh dan john here dan john university.com dan john.net remember if you have questions for the podcast email them to podcast at dan john university.com i'll do my best to answer each and every one thanks so much okay good night